So, today our scripture reading uh, came from the book of Mark. It's the story of the baptism of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this. In the, but although the sermon title is the baptism of Jesus Christ, we're not going to be focusing much on that baptism. We're going to be focusing more on that relationship with John and Jesus. John proclaims as he's baptizing those that are coming to him in the wilderness, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He says he is not worthy to untie his sandals. You know, Matthew records... John saying this, and uh, uh, but he says, what he records is, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. It's this language that I want to focus on today, this, this language of, of, of John saying he's not worthy. Um, if we recall the, the, the narrative of the Last Supper, you all heard of that, right? Okay, yeah. You've had enough biblical education to know that Jesus had a dinner with his friends before he died, right? So in that, in that narrative, Jesus uh, uh, takes on the role of the servant, and he, and he washes the feet of the disciples. And he did this to give his disciples an example to show them that he was, uh, the kind of Messiah he was. Jesus was showing, him, showing them that, that the one who is greater than all things will be put at the lowest position in humanity in order to save the world. John, in fact, John the Baptist, is, is telling the people that he's not even worthy to carry or to untie the sandals of Jesus, let alone wash his feet. So why does John feel this way? Why does he feel like he's not worthy to serve Jesus. Do you ever feel that way? Before you answer that, I want to read a story to you. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so the father divided the estate between his two sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country where he squandered the wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and I am here starving to death? You know, I will set out, and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran out to his son. And he threw his arms around him and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and, uh, and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost, but 
now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields. And when he, when he came near the house, he heard the music and the festivities and saw the dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked, what's going on? They said, your brother has come home. And your father has killed the fatted calf and, uh, because he's happy to see that he is safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father was forced to come out and plead with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. And you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when your son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? The father said, my son, you are always with me. And all everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because your brother was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. Have you ever heard that story before? <laughs> yeah, you've probably heard that before. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son. The NIV actually calls it the parable of the lost son. So, who was the lost son? Anybody know? The youngest, right? The youngest. The youngest son was the lost son, right? The reason I read this parable today is because of what the younger son says to himself when he realizes what a wretch of a person he had become. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He says he's not worthy to be a son to his father. I think there's a time in all of our lives when we've done something that we're ashamed of. I think we can agree with that, right? And in that time, and sometimes much, much longer, we feel ashamed to even be in the presence of the person that we hurt or persons that we hurt. We are embarrassed. We are not worthy to be forgiven for the thing that we did to that person or those people. I think the same is true sometimes when we're disobedient to God. We feel like we are unworthy of God's forgiveness. I think that's why this parable resonates with us so much. I think it's easy to see ourselves as that younger son, right? I think this is why this is so important for us to hear this message at the start of this new year. And I would argue that there's people out there that you know that don't go to church. Anybody know people like that? absolutely will not go to church. I think that's a safe assumption, right? And I would argue that many of those people have said things in a joking way, something like, if I step into church, the building will burn down. Or if I step into a church, a bolt of lightning will probably strike me dead. You ever heard something like that? Or how about, why would I want to go to heaven when all my friends are going to be partying in hell? <laughs> You know, it, it hurts me when, when, I, when I hear things like that. You know, people joke about these things all the time, but, uh, but these are actual phrases that I used to tell people. I would say them like they were jokes. But I think deep down, it was really how I felt. I felt unworthy be called a child of God. I 
This parable is called the parable of the prodigal or the lost son. But is the younger son the only one that's lost? You know, this this parable, interesting enough, was not preached to the sinners, per se, which you would call the sinners of of the day. It wasn't uh, preached like the Sermon on the Mount to a massive crowd or on the Sea of Galilee with a bunch of just regular people. This Luke records that this parable was actually preached to the Pharisees, which makes things more interesting. Why would Jesus be preaching a message of a brother who squanders their li- his life and his inheritance on scandalous living when the Pharisees are clearly devoting their lives to living according to Torah? It doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, they're not living their lives scandalously, are they? I mean, they're not squandering their inheritance, are they? Well, the younger brother is not the only brother that is lost. The older brother is also lost. Now, he has devoted his entire life to earning his inheritance from his father. He's a good son. He's always done has always done what he has asked. And he stayed with his father when his younger brother went and squandered his inheritance. So why is he lost? What is it about him that makes him lost? Well, when the younger brother decided to return to his father in disgrace, I mean, when he did that, the father, of course, he just sat on the porch and waited for him to come and grovel, right? To his feet? No. The father actually went out and met him, went out to the road and met him on the road. And when the brother, when the brother saw that the festivities were going on, and he saw the party, right? Did he go right in there and, and, and talk to his father, pull his father off to the side and talk to him? No. He embarrassed his father at that party and forced him to come out to plead with him. He's obviously not happy that his little brother has been forgiven by his father. Not only that, not only has his uh, younger brother been restored as a son to his father, but they've killed the fatted calf and are having a huge party. You know, most of the time in the first century, people didn't eat meat. Did you know, who likes to eat meat? Who ate meat yesterday? Who plans on eating meat today? (laughs) Right? Yeah. Back then, meat was reserved for special occasions and feast days, big celebrations. Most of the time, they would just eat like uh, breads and vegetables and stuff like that. So not only was the son forgiven, but the father was celebrating him. And the older brother reminds his father that this little brother, the things that he did were unforgivable. And what does the father say to him? He says, you are always with me and all I have is yours. What he's saying is is he doesn't value the younger son any less or any more. He's only celebrating because this younger son has been returned to him. So what makes the older brother lost? Well, the older son is unable to forgive the younger son. He sees the work that he's done, the way that he's lived his life as his righteousness. He compares himself to the son, the younger son, his younger brother. He compares how he lived his life to that younger brother, and he says, I'm better than him. Just like the Pharisees saw their obedience as their righteousness. They felt that because they kept Torah, they were righteous. Are church people like that sometimes? I would argue that it is easy for me to say that I've devoted my life to God. It's easy for me to say that. I became a pastor and I I study my faith in God's word in seminary. I've devoted the rest of my life to obedience, to serving God, and and God's calling me as a pastor. 
It's easy for me to say that, that the works that I do are, become, uh, are for God, right? But when I do that, I become the older brother. My works become my righteousness, and Jesus becomes no more than a moral teacher instead of my Savior. My own righteousness becomes the reason I'm lost. In his book, The Prodigal God, Timothy Keller says, if, like the elder brother, you believe that God ought to bless you and help you because you've worked hard and have obeyed him and, 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 and because you are a good person, then Jesus is, may be your helper. He may be your example, even your inspiration, but he is not your savior. You are serving as your own savior. You know, it's easy to look at the world from the doorway of this church and to judge and to criticize the unchurched people because of the way they live. It's easy to do that. But that's not what God has called us to do. You know, God didn't even call us to fill this church with Christians. You know that? I mean, where does Scripture say, go and therefore fill churches with Christians? I don't think that's in the Bible. You know, I'm the, I'm the pastor of this church. I'm a servant of God, and I'm forgiven. But I'm not worthy. Because of the way I've lived my life, I'm not worthy to be a pastor. Because of the way I've lived my life, I am not worthy to be a servant of God. Because of the way I've lived my life, I'm not worthy to be forgiven. And yet, God forgives me. God has made me his servant, and God has appointed me as your pastor. This is precisely what John the Baptist was, what he meant when he told the people that he wasn't worthy to carry the sandals of Jesus Christ. He was not worthy to do the things that he did. And yet, God called him to preach to the people, preparing the way for Jesus, and even called him to baptize the Messiah. You know, I refuse to sit on a hill looking down on this world, trying to impose my will upon it. Refuse. I choose to be more like John. I acknowledge that I am no better than anyone else in this world. And I will go into the world and I will share God's love with them. Just like the Father did in the parable, I will meet them on the road. I will meet them where they are and I will show them they are loved. Whether you are the lost brother, the younger brother who is new to church, or if you're the older brother that's been obedient to God their whole lives, remember that we have all sinned and come short to the glory of God. In his letter to the Romans, Paul says, I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God.
God.